in the game for a while. <laughs> but <laughs> also my inspiration for the cupcake. Oh, I love it. My little Hello Kitty cupcake stress ball, which I've been hitting. Adorable. So yeah. Okay, so I think we're getting close to about 15 after the hour. So I'm going to do a quick explanation for those, because I think we have one person who wasn't here yesterday. And for the sake of the actual explaining what we're actually doing and what this is all about. So everyone can hear me? Everyone can see me? Perfect. So hi, welcome to Vajika and Autodesk Tinkercad presents Tinker Together webinars. So this series that we're doing daily is to encourage you to tinker together at home where it is with us here on our webinars via YouTube where our recordings are, or even later with your family and friends as something to do in order to encourage you to build, make, learn during this time. I am joined today by a special guest. Alex, say hi. Hello. So Alex has a YouTube channel called Bite Size. Did I say it correctly? Booyaka. And Very nice. Today, boom, to add the Transformer project we started on yesterday to real life. So who remembers exactly what we did yesterday? So I know one person may not. I know one person who is here actually does though. I'm gonna say like, hint, hint. Just drop it in the Q&A part because as you guys remember, this is a very interactive webinar. This is not a lecture hall. I'm not here to just yell at you. We're trying to tinker together, which includes me actually showcasing that um, not all the time my prototypes or projects come out perfect, which is, the kind of disadvantage slash advantage of showing this live. So I see one person has said, we made something with cupcakes. Okay, that's good. We made something with cupcakes. What we actually made was a 3D design or a CAD model, which stands for Computer Aided Design. So we made a CAD model of a cupcake. So what I'm gonna do is have us jump into Tinkercad. If you already don't have a Tinkercad account, don't worry, just go to tinkercad.com, you can see it and the chat box for some of you trying to see that. And we're gonna hop right into what we did yesterday. And Alice hasn't seen this yet, so <laughs> I'm hoping for some hmm, feedback. I'm very excited to see it. So I'm gonna show where we stopped yesterday. So yesterday, this is where we stopped. We see we had one little icing top that went rogue and nobody knows what happened to it. But this was our 3D design of a cupcake. So if I hop over here, you can actually see if it loads up. I did a little tweaking to our cupcakes, but for those who are just joining us, I'm going to do the painstaking, painstakingly, oh my god, the painful process of doing this from scratch. So I practiced this morning. Let's see if we can time me being able to actually do this. And this is where I get concerned because I can feel, I can feel the software slowing down on me, but let's not do this right now. Show me, show me a good time. Yes, there we go. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is the trick I showed you guys before is that you can go to the upper right hand corner to the light bulb and you can hide some of your shapes. So I missed a couple of cupcakes. So I'm gonna go ahead and undo for a second and make sure I disappear eight out of the nine cupcakes so we can zoom in on one to get a feel for it. You see how you can do these things repeatedly and there's still that one moment that the software goes, oh, you, you think you're having a good day? No, you're not gonna have that great of a day. But who cares, it's Thursday, and we're almost at the end of the week, so we're gonna continue striving and try this one more time. Ah, it's okay, we're gonna do it bootleg, guys. I'm taking the icing off, as some people at birthday parties. I'm gonna actually just take the icing and eliminate the cupcakes one by one just like you would at any other celebration. The tragedy. And here, I'm gonna bring this up. And this was how we started yesterday. We started with trying to figure out with our cupcake, how we're gonna do the base or the actual cupcake in the icing. And so what we did in Tinkercad is we transformed the cylinder. So I'm gonna unroot to show you guys the magic behind this. I'm gonna move this over to the side. So as you can see here, there's multiple parts to our icing. And to use our icing, we actually did the torus base in order to make our icings. And actually the base of our cupcake, we tool or the cylinder basic shape. 
Did I just miss it? I did, it's right up here. Welcome to the actual screens are blocking my actual basic shapes. So we used the cylinder basic shape here, and we actually had a mini quiz. And the mini quiz we had was, what is the actual diameter of a cupcake? So who remembers what the actual diameter of a cupcake was? Hint, some of you said 1.5 inches, but it's not 1.5 inches. That's actually the diameter of a mini cupcake. Who remembers what the actual diameter of a regular cupcake was? And for those who want that major hint, I'm gonna go ahead and add it on there. If you're looking at your screen, you are correct. It's three inches by three inches. And the typical height, if you don't overfill your actual muffin tin, is 1.5 inches. So once we have that straight, I don't like orange cupcakes, so we changed the color. And we made it more brown or realistic to an actual cupcake color. One of the tricks I showed you is that you can actually go to custom. And if you're familiar with hex codes, you can actually go in here and actually change personally to make it look more like a yellow cake recipe, or if you want to go chocolate, that's probably too chocolate, that's more of a chocolate cupcake. So you can do it that way. On top of that, I showed you a really neat trick in order to make your cylinder not look so much of a cylinder and more like a cupcake. And that's using the shape toolbar in order to increase the number of sides, and using the bevel tool in the shape toolbar in order to round up your top and bottom. And last but not least, we use segments in order to make it a little bit more rounded. Using our left hand camera control, we changed to the front and we saw how we're transforming it to making it more like a cupcake fresh out of the oven by increasing those segments and increasing that little bevel at the top right there. So next up was the most challenging part we had to face and that was creating all of these freaking Tauruses that made up our actual group of icing on top. So we moved that cupcake to the back there. I'm gonna set her straight because I don't want her looking all lopsided. You know what, she could be straight later. We're gonna find the beauty and the imperfection today. So we went over to our Taurus tool and we brought it over. Now remember, the base of our cupcake is three inches. So our icing, we want to cover the entire top of our cupcake. So that means the first layer of our icing needs to also be three inches, boom, by three inches. Next up, we wanted to make sure the thickness of our icing was about a quarter of an inch. So I'm gonna do fitted view so we can see a little bit better. And we made sure it's a quarter of an inch is our torus. Now, we need to make all the other ridges of our icing. The way we do this is we go to our left-hand side, go to our duplicate and repeat tool, and we're gonna duplicate and repeat our torus. Now, here's the fun part. We're actually gonna use that black triangle above as I showed you yesterday, in order to increase the height of our torus off our work plane. And we're gonna increase the height, making sure is 0.25. Now, here comes the part on how we make sure that the actual size of our second ring is different. So we said the base was three inches. And every time we move up a level, we said we we're gonna decrease the length and the width by 0 0.5 inches. So three inches minus 0 0.5 inches is 2.5 inches. Remember, we had to do all that math yesterday on a scrap piece of paper, because you were like, engineer, of course they do. We just don't let you guys know about it. So here, by 2.5 inches, click enter. And the neat thing about using that duplicate and repeat tool instead of copy and paste and Tinkercad is about to be revealed. So here, while we still have that object selected, we can go back to our tool, which is Control D on our keyboard, and Tinkercad remembers exactly what we did with the previous shape. So instead of having to go back and do it individually multiple times, I could just click away and make my actual cupcake topping. Hey, let's add another layer to it. Once I'm done, I can actually change my camera view to see all my layers. And we see our cupcake is kind of on a tilt, right? Like it's an on-ramp. Well, we get to use my favorite tool in Tinkercad, which is the align tool. Would we'll make it look like that I'm an artist who's perfect at centering my actual designs. So what we're gonna do is press the shift key and select all of the torses we have here that make up our icing tower. We're gonna go over to the right hand side and click the align tool. And we're gonna align down the middle and then we're gonna align down the center. 
And you see how it compacted our icing to make sure everyone's hunky-dory? And ta-da, we made our icing. Now, one of the things we had a little challenge yesterday about was nobody wants a hole in the middle of their icing, right? So this is up to you. You can either go over to your basic shapes after you click off, which is what I forgot to do, and you can add a sphere that's gonna fit snugly in the middle of your icing tower, or you can add a cone if you wanna pretend like you pull up when you add your icing to the top of your cupcake. And then last but not least, you can add a paraboloid to the top of your actual shape. I'm a paraboloid fan because I used to be a cake decorator. I know, shocking, right? And I actually really love using the layer to drop and let it pull up and then swirling again because I didn't like the sharp cones. They seemed a little, what's a nice way to say it, basic to me. But I know some people, there was a lot of folks in the Q&A section that also didn't like my opinion that I hate sprinkles. I think sprinkles, I, I see your face, Alice. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but I actually do not like sprinkles. So I hate to break it to you, but I'm breaking out some sprinkles later. <laughs> I just, I don't know what it is. I think I went to, I think my school had too many like celebrations with bad sprinkles on cakes. And I think I've just developed a hatred for sprinkles. And as an adult, I've not, <laughs> no matter how hard I try, I've tried getting gourmet sprinkles. I've tried making sprinkles from scratch. I just, I just hate it. I just, there's just- That's okay. I, That's yeah, all right. I, I pair it with my hatred of mushrooms which some people call it extreme. I call mushrooms, pickles, and sprinkles are probably my top three of things I absolutely hate. Oh, pickles, pickles, I have to strongly disagree with you, but <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll give you that for today. Okay, let me have this one for today. I'm gonna say, I'm making my little cab model, my little top, ice and topping. And you can see here that I have it here. Now remember how we make sure all of our shapes move together or they merge together? We use the group tool. So on the upper right hand side, we grouped it together to make it all uniform, our little icing top. It picked that color, which I'm going along with, but I like blue. And since I have that option, I'm gonna make it blue. So now I'm gonna go back to my home view. I'm gonna move, ooh, I could have made that a little bigger, but we're gonna pretend we didn't see that just for the sake of time. See, adults even do this too. I'm gonna raise it up. I'm gonna select the shift key on my keyboard and select my cupcake body. And unlike in real life, all I have to do is press the align tool in order to make sure that my cupcake is actually satisfactory. Now I'm trying to get this one over here. So give me one second. I want it to be aligned down the middle. And booyaka, I got my cupcake. If you change your camera angle, because what did I teach you? You gotta check your angles. Our icing is floating on top of our cupcake. So we need to make sure we bring that bad boy down so you see me kind of trying to zoom, checking her out, trying to see, there we go. I'm looking for that black triangle that gives me my height and depth change. So I'm gonna bring her down and that seems pretty good. I'm gonna select my icing, select my cupcake body. I'm gonna group her and ta-da. Ooh, no, 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 no. I don't want a blue cupcake body. So what was the thing we have to do? We have to go to solid and we actually have to click multicolor. That allows for when we group multiple things to keep the colors that we picked before. Because that 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 blue, I know some people like rainbow cupcakes. No. <laughs> now it's just like, what do you like? <laughs> I'm a huge fan of like Hello Kitty stuff. So I do, I do like the super kawaii stuff, but um I'm just picky, is what my mother would call it. Just very picky. I mean, I think if there's a thing to be picky about, it's cake. You need quality cake in your life. Yes. My whole thing is once I became an adult and I was able to dictate the kind of cupcakes I was able to eat, I just never looked back. <sighs> yes, that's a proud to be the greatest flex you'll hear from me about what it's like <laughs> to be an adult. But now we have our cupcakes. So we go back to what we did yesterday. All we did besides this poor little cupcake that got shifted, this icing got shifted, but it's okay. All we did was replicate our cupcake nine times. And remember what I told you your work plane was. Your work plane is like taking a slice of the thousands of slices it takes up to create your 3D design. So everyone have your ruler. Remember what I showed you yesterday. Length and width is 2D design, which is two dimensions. 
almost like a slice of your 3D design. Why is it a slice? Because you have length, width, and height. Makes up your three dimensions for 3D design. So remember, your 3D design is almost like thousands of pieces of paper. And what we're using our work plane as is one piece of paper to cut our actual 3D design into slices. So that's where we actually left off yesterday. Today, we're gonna figure out why did Miss Nisha actually torture us and make us go through all of this just to make a cupcake. Like, who eats a cupcake in slices? When I eat a cupcake, it's one, two bites, or I just swallow the whole thing if it's a mini one. Why would we slice and why does that have to, what does that have anything to do with 3D printed food? And to take that away, Alex, you ready? I'm ready. Okay, let's unravel the mystery. Yeah, so I'm super excited uh, to be hopping in here to make some cupcakes and actually take sort of this idea of 3D printed design and bring it into something that you can do at home because I think most of us don't have a 3D printer at home, but we do have a bunch of stuff around us that we can use to make prototypes and to dive into just making some cool, fun stuff. So I wanted to introduce myself quickly first um, so my name is Alex, uh, so I am a science communicator, and so when I was in high school, I kind of loved all things and I didn't really know what exactly I wanted to do, but I knew I liked science, but I also liked art and I liked English and I just liked all these things, and so when I got to college, I still couldn't decide, and so I did a bio major and I did a film major. And then I went off to work in film for a while, and then I went to grad school for uh, genetics, and I just finally decided that I didn't have to decide, and that there wasn't this sort of dichotomy between science and art, and I could do both. So that's what I do now, is I've tried to combine science and art to make science communication videos to try and bring the stuff that I love to more people. So I'm a big fan of the A in STEAM, right, because art is there are so many different principles in art that apply to science and the principles in science that apply to art. So I love sort of combining the two. So I'm going to talk today about 3D printed food. Uh, so I have a little presentation here that I want to share with you about that. So hopefully you can all see my 3D printed food slides. Good. All right. Awesome. So when I started thinking about 3D printed foods, the first 3D printer that I remember seeing was actually a printer that printed on sugar. And this was maybe 10 years or so ago, but they sort of had this like base of sugar and then they heated up the sugar layer by layer by layer to create what were essentially just kind of like cool looking sugar cubes. And now we see 3D printers that more often work by sort of extruding something to build up layer after layer after layer. But my first like introduction to 3D printing was with sugar. So the idea of 3D printed foods, for a while I thought that's all you could do. Like that was in my head, what you could do with 3D printing was just make food. Um, but we actually sort of took a long time to get back around to there. And so now 3D printed foods are kind of taking off in a lot of different uh, spheres and areas. Um, and first of all, it's just because it's cool. So this is a lizard 3D printed out of guacamole. And so they loaded up a 3D food printer with guacamole and printed out a lizard, which is just awesome and fun. Uh, here we have a castle made out of hummus. Again, kind of ridiculous, but super fun. Like I would eat more hummus if it was all shaped like a castle. Um, and then also things like pizza, right? So you can imagine that you could 3D print the base of the pizza and cook that by extruding dough and you can extrude the actual uh, pizza sauce and then the cheese and all that so you can slowly build up these layers of whatever food you want to actually eat. So this sounds kind of silly, right? Like all of these examples have just been sort of fun and silly, but they work again with the same sort of idea of 3D printing you might have seen with these machines that extrude things. So this is a machine extruding, again, a little silly, but extruding a corn paste in the shape of a corn cob. And so it's sort of going around layer by layer by layer and building up that food. And again, while this is just sort of a cool presentation of the food, 
this can actually be really helpful to people who may not be able to eat solid foods. So there are a number of different trials that are using 3D printed food for patients who have uh, swallowing difficulties known as dysphagia. So this sometimes happens in the elderly, it can happen to people after they have a stroke where they can't really swallow hard solid foods anymore, so they have to eat purees. But as with, I think all of us, if all we could eat were purees, it gets pretty boring. And so it's actually a big problem for a lot of these patients that they don't wanna eat and they lose their appetite because the food they're being presented is not delicious looking and it's just sort of all purees. So there are a couple of different studies. So performance is a big one that happened in Brussels a few years ago that we're actually taking these foods and using 3D printers to make them, to give them different textures again. So still soft, but a little bit more textured and to make them look like the original foods that people might have been eating. So taking pureed carrots and making them look again, a little bit more like a carrot. And they could also mix in special nutrients and vitamins for whatever uh, these patients' different needs were. So it was a way to sort of get them to be more excited about eating, to help them eat these nutritious foods. And they were also specially preparing them in a package that was super easy to ship and microwave. So you didn't have to be in sort of a nursing home to receive one of these. You could be a patient living at home, but still receive these nutritious meals that would hopefully encourage you to eat a little bit more than if you were just sort of eating something that looked like applesauce day in and day out. So this can be, it, it can be used for sort of fun purposes, but it can also have really important ways to solve problems as well. Um, and another problem that 3D printing food is trying to help solve is food waste. So this is from a company called Up Printing Food. And their idea is that there's so much food waste that happens from uh, things like stale bread or things like fruits and vegetables that don't look very pretty but are totally nutritious. And so what they're doing is they're taking those foods that would otherwise be discarded and they're creating them into, again, this kind of puree that they can then put into these beautiful designs like this and then bake into crackers. And so they're taking this sort of food waste and they're using 3D printing to reimagine it into something that's really saving that food and preventing it from just being thrown away. So again, using it to solve a problem. Um, and then this is one of my favorite things is that we've got astronauts who are going out farther and farther into space. And one of the things that we wanna think about for them is nutrition. So there are lots of projects to try and grow vegetables in space to give them a fresh source of vegetables and something to care for. But they also probably are gonna want a whole lot of variety in their diet. So there was just a uh, project that was launched a few months ago that was working on printing the first 3D printed steak in space. So you can imagine that if you are off on a long distance mission to Mars, there's not gonna be a cow anywhere nearby, but maybe you wanna eat a hamburger. And their idea is that they can grow uh, sort of beef cells up in space, load them into a 3D printer, and then 3D print them into something that looks like a steak or a hamburger or some other kind of meat you would wanna eat. So at the moment, again, it's kind of a little silly to think about them 3D printing steaks in space, but it's a real thing to consider as we wanna try and feed people as they move farther and farther away from our planet. How are we going to create food sources for them when we can't just ship them something overnight? And also, uh, I think it's kind of cool that 3D printing has already been happening up in space for non-food items as well. So this is a, uh, a ratchet wrench that was 3D printed um, up in space. And the whole idea was that, again, if you're six months away uh, on a mission to Mars and suddenly a tool breaks and you need a new tool, you can't just Amazon one overnight, right? You're going to need some way of making that tool up in space. And so this was a design that the actual uh, 3D design was designed down on Earth. They sent the uh, file up to space and then they printed it in space and this one was just a test one to see how did it work how well did that whole process go but again they now have a system set up where if something breaks if they need a specific tool or a specific piece they can now print it right up in space rather than having to wait even when they're on the space station they have to wait for months until the next resupply mission and so this is a way for them to sort of iterate and make new things up in space in real time so again, I, I really like the concept of 3D printing as something that can help us solve problems. And so we've actually seen that recently in the news with a lot of things happening around COVID-19. So you might have seen this story um, about these uh, doctors in Italy who needed more valves for respirators in the hospital and the company just wasn't able to produce them fast enough. 
So they took measurements of these valves and they actually 3D printed them themselves. And so rather than having to wait, because these patients needed these valves immediately to be able to get the sort of treatment that they needed, they 3D printed them themselves and were able to do that really rapidly and solve this problem. And so that was one of the first things we saw sort of coming out of uh, 3D printing and sort of COVID-19. But now there are a lot of initiatives as well who are trying to create PPE for nurses and healthcare workers on the front lines who may not otherwise have access to them. So there have been a lot of uh, both companies and individuals who have been donating their time to create 3D printed face shields so that they can actually try and help keep people safe. Um, and I also, I just saw online uh, a, I think he was an Eagle Scout. He was either a Boy Scout or an Eagle Scout who did a whole project where nurses were complaining about the fact that when you're wearing those surgical masks all day, it starts to hurt your ears because you have those elastics pulling on them. And so he created and started 3D printing these little plastic pieces that would go in the back to relieve that pressure off of their ears and just started donating them to his local hospital. So I just sort of love that as this story of somebody at home, a high school student at home, seeing a problem and using sort of prototyping and 3D printing to solve it in real time and out in the real world, which I think is really, really cool. So we're not gonna be using an actual 3D printer today because I do not have one. Um, and so for those of us who don't have a 3D printer at home, I wanted to think about how we could use some of these ideas and use this idea of uh, sort of 3D printing food to make something that was still fun and tying in with the cupcake theme. But I think before we, before we start to make our project, Again, Nisha was talking about all of these different layers and thinking about building these layers up on top of each other to make something. And I kind of like the fact that we already do this in food all the time. So this is a picture of a layer cake and it is the same principle where you are taking layers and you are stacking them on top of each other to make a 3D object. Now, of course, each cake layer is 3D already, but if you think of that as a little 2D layer, you're building up these 2D layers to make something delicious and cool. And this is just a simple layer cake, but as I'm sure we've all seen, there are crazy types of cakes that people build these days from this same principle of just building up these little layers. But again, I'm not gonna bake an 18 layer cake today, but what I do have is cardboard. And so this is a really cool laser cut dinosaur where the whole idea is the same thing. You're just cutting layer after layer after layer after layer to create something 3D out of a 2D starting material. So that is what we're gonna be starting with today. We're going to be taking cardboard because I wanted to build using stuff you probably already have at home. So I did not go out and get anything for this project. Everything that I'm using today was already somewhere in my apartment. Um, so we're gonna be using cardboard to build our 3D designed cupcakes. So it's all about prototyping. Uh, so I'm going to take the uh, screen share down so that you can see just me again, because I want to show you some things that I have done. So we have our lovely Tinkercad uh, 3D cupcake design, and we have our cardboard. But I also am, I'm a, I'm a very tactile, drawy kind of person. So I also did some of my own iterations of prototyping. Uh, before this, before Tinkercad. So my first one is behind me up here on my whiteboard. So yesterday, I drew out my cupcake and I started to think about what size I wanted my cupcake to be, how big was the icing gonna be relative to the base of the cupcake. So I drew this all out and then it was kind of a little bit off. Like it's a five inch, a five inch cupcake is a pretty tall cupcake. Um, but I wanted to do a little math and figure out exactly how all this was gonna work. So this was my, this was my starting point. Um, but I also wanted to think about, okay, how many layers of cardboard am I going to need to build this cupcake? So I moved over to my, my ideas notebook, uh, which is where there are no bad ideas in your ideas notebook. Um, but I decided to do some prototyping here again, just by hand. And I, I changed the dimensions of my cupcake a little bit. But the thing that was really important to me was figuring out how much cardboard I was going to need to build my cupcake. How many layers was I gonna to have to cut out? Because if I was gonna to have to cut out 200 layers of cardboard, that was gonna to be too crazy of a project. So what I did is I measured the thickness of my cardboard. And again, this was just from random boxes lying around my house. And it turns out that most cardboard is five thirty seconds of an inch tall, which is kind of a ridiculous measure. 
Um, but that is sort of your standard cardboard size. And so I knew that I wanted my actual cupcake base to be about three inches tall. So I did the math to figure out that that would mean that each inch was going to be 6.4 layers of cardboard. And so if I wanted it to be three inches tall, it was going to end up being about 19 layers of cardboard just for the base before we got to the icing. Um, and that seemed pretty reasonable. I could cut out 20-ish layers of cardboard for the base. And then I figured out that I was going to need about another 16 for the top of my cupcake. So I did that and I... Uh, I drew a whole bunch of circles out uh, on my computer. So I measured out all of these different sizes of circles on my computer because I also wanted, I didn't just want a straight cupcake base. I thought it would be nice if my cupcake sort of had a little bit of an angle to it. So the base was a little smaller than the top. So I measured that the base of my cupcake, uh, based on this little prototype here, I figured my base would be about three inches and that the top of the cupcake I figured I'd start at four inches. Turns out this was a little big, but I decided to start here. And so as that uh, math, so the bottom was three inches, the top was four inches, and that meant that because it was three inches tall, every new layer of cardboard would be 0 0.05 inches larger in diameter than the one before it, which Wait. is not much. Wait, you did 0 0.5 inches as well? I did. So let me tell you something weird. So yesterday, our original measurements for the cupcake was actually five inches in height, with the height of the cupcake base being three inches and the icing being two inches. No. That's where I showed the whiteboard. I was like, oh, no. <laughs> See? Remember I mean, what I was mentioning about educated guesses? This yes. is what I'm talking about. Yeah, because that just, again, that was just me sort of thinking like what seems about right for a cupcake. And I figured I would start there. Um, and so, yeah, that whole idea of an educated guess is exactly that. Like you go and you start. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about iteration after this as well, um, because my cupcake uh, has some challenges. And the next time I make it, I'm going to make it a little different. But here is where um, I know that now, because we have that uh, Tinkercad model as well, you can make those layers. So I made my own pattern, again, just by figuring out how, all the, how big all these circles would be. And also up here, my tape measure. And there was a lot of tape measuring on some cardboard. Um, and I cut out a bunch of circles of all those different sizes. So I know we're going to have a minute to do this ourselves uh, in just a second. But in the end, I wound up with a whole lot of cardboard circles, so many cardboard circles. Um, and when I took all of those uh, chunks from my base, this was kind of a very large cupcake. Like here's the cupcake next to my face. It's a very large cupcake. So as I was doing this, I decided, okay, I don't actually need all of this. So that was the first thing is I drew out my design and I tried it, but it was a little too big. But I do think I'm going to keep some of these. So I started to glue the bottoms together. And again, just whatever glue I had around my house, little dab of glue and put them together. And we're going to do that in a second. But I think I might add three or four more layers. I think I might make it a little taller. So now if I measure this, my original design said that the base would be three inches. But now it's a little closer to two and a half or maybe two and a quarter inches tall. So again, I tried it, I thought about it, I didn't like it, I tried something a little different. So I cut out all these circles out of cardboard for the bottom of my cupcake. And then I also cut out a whole bunch of smaller circles for the top of my cupcake. And I, I had some white paint lying around, so I painted them white so that they would be icing. Um, but again, it was just something I had lying around, so we painted this white. And so now uh, I'm gonna glue these together with you all in a minute. But if we just stack them, even without gluing them, we have a little cardboard cupcake. And it's the same idea of that 3D printing where you just do layer by layer by layer by layer. But I did this without a 3D printer. I just used some cardboard. If so, I can say so, first, yeah. I'm not gonna showcase my cupcake because that puts my cupcake to shame. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and start from scratch with you all with my cupcake. Cause now I'm like, huh. This is where my basic skills come into play. 
But if you haven't already, feel free to check out the chat box because we're about to transition into prototyping. So make sure that you have some paper, a writing utensil, like a pen or a pencil or a marker, a ruler, as well as a pair of scissors in order to just get started. If you have some cardboard lying around, a lot of us have some Amazon packages or some last minute mail, this will be the time to get it. It doesn't even have to be this thick of a cardboard. You can actually use like a cereal box or anything in your recycling or a 12 pack can to actually make cardboard. The only difference is you're gonna have to make a lot more circles in order to get to the height that you want versus if you use a thicker material like a cardboard from a box, for example. So we're gonna give everybody a good number of five minutes to get started on that. But I'm, I'm just gonna say while everyone's getting that straight, <laughs> literally that whiteboard did have me have a freak out moment. So I was like, are my numbers that on par? Yes. Because yesterday what we were discussing was back of the envelope calculations or educated guesses. And that a lot of times when you're building stuff, you're not gonna know the exact measurement of something, but you can use things or reference points from everyday life in order to make an educated guess or a back of the envelope calculation. And so I explained that back of the envelope was like back in the day, we literally wrote our calculations out on the back of the envelope because email wasn't as prevalent. So most times you had a lot of mail that you had to use. And in terms of educated guesses, we were trying to figure out without Googling, we eventually Googled just to double check our educated guess, how big do we think a cupcake is? Once we realize like your thumb is about from here to here mm -hmm. and uh, here, here is about two inches, like is a cupcake bigger than your hand? If it's not bigger than your hand, then we know it's at least two to three inches or less. So that gave us some room to start narrowing it down. Is it 1.5 inches? Is it two inches? Is it 2.5 inches? What about the mini cupcakes? And having to create a special category for mini cupcakes. So we played around with what actually would be our educated guess on what is the size of a cupcake without Sadly enough, having a cupcake in front of us. <laughs> I know. I, I wish I had a real cupcake. I, I was literally trying to bake cupcakes last night. And I don't know if it was the universe or I just wasn't baking straight, but all I got was very depleted base cupcakes. And I was like, these don't even deserve icing on them. I'm just going to stick to my, um, <laughs> my cardboard cupcake and I'm going to see if I can actually just 3D print a cupcake and just pretend. Just keep it yeah. moving. Worst oh. case, at the end of the day, my little Hello Kitty cupcake is here to be comfortable, Ooh. but yes. <laughs> so I want everyone to get those materials. If you have any questions for us while we're waiting, feel free to shoot me a question in the Q&A section and I can either or ask Alex to actually answer it herself. So how long did it actually take you to make your cardboard cupcake? Because we're only going to have like maybe 10 to 15, maybe 30 minutes just to get started with this yeah. project. But how long did it take you? I would say that it took me probably 10 to 15 minutes to trace out all the circles. That did take a while to actually trace out all the circles. And then I was probably cutting circles for about an hour. Uh, there's about an hour of cutting circles. Um, so I might recommend starting with a mini cupcake for today. Um, <laughs> but then, then once I had all the circles, it was super fast because then you're just stacking them together. And it was actually kind of fun because I, when I cut them out, I did it slightly in a disordered manner. So I just, I really wound up with this like stack of circles that were just sort of lying around me on the floor. And I had to figure out like, okay, well, which one goes on top of which one? And how do I stack them? Cause they were each, each one was just a tiny bit larger than the other one. So it's kind of like doing a puzzle to figure out like what order they went in. So I had way too much fun at that point in time, which is also why when I stacked the, the icing, which now, I mean, on top of my cupcake, uh, it's a little large. It's kind of a very large glob of icing, but I was like, you know what, this is fun. I'm going to paint it white and I'm going to go find something that can be sprinkles. So I'm, I'm going to add sprinkles to mine once we've constructed them. But. Oh, okay. Please post on your, I think you have a Twitter account, right? I think I, I do. Your Please post the image on Twitter because I would actually oh, yes. see what it looks like with your sprinkles on top. Absolutely. Yeah. Once, um, once we're done constructing here, I'm gonna, I will definitely post it because I'm, I'm pretty proud of it. But again, it's yes. not perfect. So this is a cupcake prototype. I learned a bunch of things from building this. Um, and I have ideas how I could make the next one even better. And so for me, that's half the point is just this idea of you make a plan, you build it, you see what worked and what didn't work, and then you try it again. 
Yeah. I would say for me, the first time I attempted this, I had a little bit of an issue and that I started to become a perfectionist, which is one of the things I am trying to get better about because I was like, it's not the exact circle. So I kept recutting my circles and I think I just have to get to a point and sometimes I'm going to give you a sneak peek of me in the lab. Sometimes it'll be three days me trying to perfect something and then something's due in three hours and I'm like, you know what? Okay, I just have to let it go, give it to the universe and keep it moving. So I think that's important though. I feel like sometimes that's how, I mean, that's how the real world works. Sometimes there's a deadline and like, you just have to be okay with like, it's good and done. And because that for me is one of the hardest things too, is figuring out like, when is a project done? When is a video that I'm making done? When is something that I'm writing done? Like, when is it done? And sometimes it's really hard. And if you don't have an outside deadline to be like, well, it has to be due here. And so you just, you just have to figure out like, okay, like I'm happy with this product and I could make it better. And yeah. now I've learned things that I could do in the future, but for right now we're done. Yes. <laughs> I would say for me, I need a deadline because I can spend weeks trying to perfect something. And as you hear me today going, no, I'm not gonna show it. It's not ready yet. It's not ready. No, I'm not gonna do that. It's not ready. But I would say I have my cardboard ready. Good. I have my pre-cut circles. So what I'm gonna Good. do is try to do some magic. So you're gonna see me go bah, 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 and try to showcase how amazing and just like that. <laughs> oh, very nice. Okay. And let's see if you actually need some lighting because I'm the person who doesn't want to hear, oh God, I can't see anything. Okay, so does it look fancy? <laughs> it looks great. Okay, so for my pieces, I have my paper. So I'm gonna show you guys how I actually got these little slices that I'm using in order to create my cupcake. So remember I said that our work plane, I'm gonna lower this light because she's a bit high in my face. There we go. <laughs> so remember when we were using Tinkercad and I said we were going to use the work plane in order to slice through our cupcake? So I'm going to share my screen with you and show you how I actually did that. So for right here, I had changed all the heights of our cupcakes previously and I decreased each cupcake by 0 0.25 inches. So this cupcake is down 0 0.25 inches. And then I went 0 0.5, 0 0.75, one inch, 1.25, 1.5. And you can slowly start seeing the work plane cutting through the cupcake. So when I look at it from the front camera angle, that's why you see the cupcakes, each row is going down at a diagonal. Once I actually had my cupcake sliced, I was able to use the export tool in my upper right hand corner. And when I click the export tool, remember what I told you, if you want to export to your 3D printer, there's two file formats, your STL and your OBJ file format. If you want to export it to something like a laser cutter or to your printer, instead of just doing regular circles and trying to draw them out, if you're not an artist like me, just go ahead and send it out as an SVG file. So that is scaled vector graphic, which means I get to cool, do cool things like this when I export. So let me show you the software I use to actually upload that bad boy right here. I like how I feel like a DJ when I'm on Zoom. So, so here is the actual 2D slice of all my cupcakes. So you can see here how every time it went down and it went through a ring of the icing, you're gonna see two rings. So if you look at, this is what the printed version looks like. This is when one of the icing rings interacted with another icing ring, is how you have two rings. So when you print this out, don't worry about this middle part. If you don't have a printer, a trick I like to tell people is that you can actually put a blank piece of computer paper over your computer or tablet and use a pencil, very lightly use a pencil. And I'm gonna say that again, very lightly use a pencil. Don't stab your computer or your tablet and you can trace your circle. So basically what I did is I sent this to my printer. I printed it off and I was able, wait one second. Oh, okay, one sec. So I just got a comment that everyone can see one camera. They can only see my face cam and the screen. Got you. 
sorry, Zoom has a couple of features that I can't do, screen share and multiple camera angles. So thank you for letting me know. See, this is why interactive webinars make a difference. So I know that I'm not recording something, nobody else can see what I'm talking about. So I took my little PDF here, I'm gonna stop sharing. And I actually printed it out so you can actually see this is what it looks like when it was printed. This inner circle that you saw in the original outline is when one of the rings of the icing actually cut through that slice. So that's why you have that inner circle. So don't worry about cutting out the inner circle. You can leave it be. So now that I have that, I have all my pieces of paper here. If you want to use a thicker piece of paper as your trace, I suggest using cardstock like I have here. But I wanted to go with computer paper because I wanted to limit myself to things you guys probably have at home. So right now, I'm going to take one of my circles. I'm actually going to put it where I feel I can easily get to it, especially if you're using scissors. I always recommend start at a corner so you can easily get to it and remove it. And I see Alex shaking her head because it was a hard lesson I had to learn when yes. I with cardboard. <laughs> it took me so long to learn that yesterday. So that is uh, the best tip because when I started, oh gosh, I don't know if you can see on all of these discarded pieces that I have, but I had them all in the middle of this big sheet. And then I had to like first cut around each circle to get close to it so that then I could actually cut in a nice circle. So it really takes a long, long time to, <laughs> to get all the way to the circles if you do them in the middle. So starting at a corner is a great tip. So I would say start at the corner. For those who can't see the side angle, I'm gonna show it on the front camera. This inner circle is what happens when you do a cross section versus the outer circle. So let me see if I can just go to full tablet mode. Give me one second. Well, I'm saying tablet, but it's countertop. Why am I thinking my countertop's my tablet? Boy, yes, things happen. No, we can't hear you at all. I think you need to turn on the sound on your, your countertop. You see how... <laughs> And now we have the weird echo of technology. Is that better? Okay, perfect. So give me one second. I'm going to make sure things honky dory. Okay, can everyone hear me? Can everyone see my station? Perfect. Okay, so I have my little corner here. And so I'm going to start as close to the upper corner as possible. And you can either use a ballpoint pen or you can use a permanent marker in order to do this. So what I'm gonna do right now, I prefer using my permanent marker because I like to see my line. I'm gonna hold down my actual circle and this is the part I need you all to just give me, raise your hand, because I just need all the positive energy as I attempt this. When I tell you kindergarten, I'm pretty sure I failed if my math skills weren't so high. I am not even joking. I think I actually have a letter that my teacher sent about Nisha's art skills need drastic improvement. <laughs> But now it can be like, ha, 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 I don't need art skills. I have CAD software, computer-aided design in order to bring my stuff to life. Makes me look like I'm a Pablo Picasso or a Leonardo da Vinci. So this is my first attempt at a circle. As you can see, it is not perfect. The first way I'm going to cut this actual bad boy out is using a pair of scissors. And you're going to see why it's so important that you want to actually start here. Ew, no. OK. Okay, we're back. <laughs> so actually cutting it here. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to make sure you guys can see, I like to cut off the tips first and go around the edge. And you see how making sure you start off at the edge already saved you so many cuts because you can just go right into your actual design. What is that song from Les Mis? Their eyes shine upon you or their eye, the eyes of history or something. <laughs> I just go really self-conscious right now. <laughs> I'm hearing a musical song and I can't remember what musical I'm hearing. So here, I'm just gonna get rid of that little edge. And ta-da, I have my first circle. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna continue using this top part in order to create my other circles. I have no idea why my little side camera is going in and out, but bear with me. So we have our first layer. So I'm gonna do this one more time. I'm gonna look at what my next layer is gonna look like. So my first layer was this one. I'm gonna use this one as my second layer. Based on how I did my cupcakes going from left to right, 
So this one's a little bigger, so I may actually have to move it down here in order to do my cut. I'm gonna do one more trace. I'm gonna go right around the circle. Whoop, whoop, see, missed that, but it's okay. Y'all didn't see that, no one saw that. My finger in my hand is gonna hide that. And we're gonna continue going around until we have it. Now for this one, I'm actually gonna show you how to cut out a shape, not with your pair of scissors, but with an actual X-Acto knife. So an X-Acto knife is one of my favorite tools. It's something I actually carry in my backpack. Funny side story, I actually <laughs> have, um, I don't know if the airport wants me to say this, but I've actually traveled with this X-Acto knife multiple times. And it was not till maybe several months and to very frequent journeys to someone point out that this is a knife and it shouldn't be in my backpack. And it was unbeknownst to me, I was traveling with it. So make sure if you take this, you take it out of your backpack because it is a sharp tool. If you've never seen an X-Acto before, you'll see these retractable blades. What I love about them is that when one of the blades get dull, you can actually pop it out and safely dispose of it to make sure you still have a sharp blade. One of my things about Safety 101 with this bad boy is make sure you only have one blade out and your finger is at the very top of it. One of the cool things about using X-Acto is for me, it's almost like the difference between carving a carrot with a butter knife versus a steak knife. As you can see here, unlike my scissors, I can get right into my outline and I'm making sure I'm keeping my hand away from my actual X-Acto blade. If you're new to it, I always suggest using your ruler, holding it down and then continuing to cut to make sure that your finger is safely away and you're keeping your material held down onto your mat. If you're curious what kind of mat I'm using, the mat I'm using to do these deep cuts without destroying my countertop is called a self-healing mat. So the reason why it's called self-healing, it's almost like it's an X-Man superpower. You can cut straight into it and no, no mistakes, no marks, no nothing. Almost like it didn't happen. So here you can see, whoop, 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 you can see my exacto cut. You can see a faint outline here. So what I'm going to do now that I know I have my trace outline is go back over my actual exacto cut. So depending on your comfort level, you can use scissors, you can use an exacto knife. I just told my morning session folks, and I actually want to see a poll. Did you guys actually have to use safety scissors when you were in kindergarten? Because it was kind of the thing I think made sure I had low grades in kindergarten when it came to art, because I could not use safety scissors for the life of me. I was the kid who ended up folding a piece of paper and just ripping it that way instead of trying to use the safety scissors. So I don't know, Alex, where did you, where did you actually go to kindergarten? So I went to school uh, actually not too far from Boston. So I grew up in Mansfield. Um, so I went to uh -huh. Mansfield Public Schools for kindergarten. And I do think that we had safety scissors, uh, though the thing I remember more was the paste that like, I wish we had just had glue sticks, right? Like glue sticks, I feel like you can get a nice solid line of glue, but with that paste, like, oh man, it's always bumpy and like you're trying to put two pieces of construction paper together and it never looks right. So Wait, yeah, I feel like the tools they gave us were just not, not adequate for our young art skills. Wait, was it concrete cement? Like it came no, out of no. art? It's, it's like a, I don't remember, I remember it was white and like just very, very thick paste. And so like, unlike oh. a glue stick where you get like this nice fine line of glue, like I remember we always had to rub it down. And this is the funniest, like weird thing to remember from kindergarten, but we'd rub it down and the teacher would be like, no lumps, no bumps, no coconuts. And we had to like rub it down until there were no more coconuts, which is just such a silly thing that has stuck with me for too many years. I love that. No, no lumps, no bumps, no coconuts. Yeah. That is so adorable. See, I just finished cutting the second one. So I'm labeling it because you just remind me of a mistake I made the first time. So I'm labeling this number one. So I know this one was cut out of this one. And then I'm labeling, labeling this one number two. So I know this one was cut out of this one. And so the way I actually assemble these is I'm gonna have my number one here. I'm gonna have my new two facing here. I'm using a glue stick because I'm using cardboard. Feel free to use whatever you have at home. You can also use tape if you fold it upon itself. 
in order to make sure you have it rigid. So you see right there, and what I'm gonna do is continue in cutting out my circles to increase the height of my actual cupcake. If you wanna use the tape method, this here I'm using gafting tape, but you can use duct tape, you can use um, regular, what is it called, um, scotch tape? Yes, scotch tape. Why I keep thinking that is not the name of it. So you fold it upon itself so it looks like this, and actually do, I'm gonna do one gafting tape, and then I'm gonna do another one with regular scotch tape just to show you all the tools in the arsenal. Because as Alex was talking about, you gotta iterate and figure out what works for you based on what's available around you. So here I have my double layer of scotch tape here. And then I can go ahead and start adding my third layer. So I'm gonna have to continue doing this. Like how many layers did you do, Alex, on your actual prototype cupcake? Yeah, so I believe I cut out 21, but how many do I have here? I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. I have 14 here, and then I have this additional stack of seven, and I think I'm going to add three more to my base um, because I feel like uh, that looks like a pretty good ratio cupcake, um, but if I take those three off, it's a little small. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to add three more right now. And what I have is I just have uh, this tacky glue, which I like your idea of a glue gun because I do have a glue gun here in the apartment, but I didn't even think of that. But I've just been using this. And so it takes a little while to dry down, but it was just as simple as put in a little glob of glue. And then I'm just going to stack my next one on top. And then that's it. So and I'm going to add a few more here. And again, I, I actually, so the, the topping here, the topping, the top of the cupcake, uh, I had had like a USPS box that was already lighter. So it was already almost this icing color, but then it had like some writing and stuff on it. So I painted it, but I even just found that before I did that, it was kind of fun just that this was probably an Amazon box. And then this was a different type of cardboard box. So I kind of like the idea of using, um, like the cereal boxes and stuff like that because you can have different colors and had I had like a, a blue a blue box for my icing that would have been even more fun but I think we've got a I don't know I don't know if this is maybe a a slightly a, a milk chocolatey kind of cupcake happening here with some vanilla frosting and see the reason why I looked at my hot glue so usually I don't go for the hot glue because I'm gonna say from personal teaching experience, one of the things I've discovered is um, I actually, it's one of the stories I tell my students every year, is I had a kid burn their tongue with a hot glue gun. And it's made me very wary, exactly. <laughs> Hold on. How, why, why, exactly. why? So um, this is gonna be a side note because we're all prototyping on what not to do. So this student was using a hot glue gun and you know how there's the glob of hot glue that comes out while it's still hot? So they accidentally touched that glob. And instead of peeling the glob off by letting it cool with the air, they stuck their finger in their mouth while the oh. glob was still boiling hot. Oh and no. Is them shrieking and looking over and wondering why all the kids were like, how did you burn your mouth? And I'm still sitting there going, what happened? What? <laughs> so oh, that poor student. Yes, and I know this student probably is going to hear through the grapevine that I've told this story again, but it's one of those stories that is like, the things you think can't hurt you, randomly will find a way. So always try to practice safety first. And you see here, so you were actually were right, because today I'm like blazing through this. So I have my number three that I've labeled. I'm going to add that one to the top here press down a little bit because I actually couldn't find my glue. And you can slowly start to see the layers. This is three out of the 27 that you did, Alex, <laughs> for your cupcake. And so you'll continue going through these layers one by one in order to create your 3D printed cupcake. So I'm not gonna do that because that's gonna take me an hour to actually show you all the layers, but to show you how you can actually explore how 2D slices come up and actually form a 3D print. One of the things I actually wanted to show you all, and I'm going to see if I can screen hop, 
was a piece of equipment that I just got into my arsenal that I think is really cool for doing something like this. So I'm gonna quickly switch. Um, Alex, have you ever heard of a cricket, of a cricket machine? I have heard of a cricket, but I have not used one myself. So I'm very excited to see this. Ooh, okay. So I'm actually really excited to show this. So let me go ahead and change the screen. And let me go ahead and get the switcheroo done. Okay, so can everyone see? See, that's what I was always looking, <laughs> that's what I'm always cautious about. So here you can actually see the screen. And you should be able to see me actually into the Cricut software. So Cricut is basically a desktop cutting machine. So just like a 3D printer is like a desktop printer, but instead of printing one page, it prints 3D objects. A Cricut is a desktop cutting machine. So it allows us to insert things like pieces of cardstock or paper, and even sometimes some less cut pieces of cardboard. We can actually put it in the machine in order to cut things. So you can see here that I've actually taken the design that I made in Inkscape or we originally made in Tinkercad and I imported it into the Cricut Design software. So you see all those familiar circles that I was cutting previously. And so what I can actually do is click make it. And let's, make, let's hold our fingers at everything. Yay, everything's working, okay. <laughs> so now you see my actually cutting mat. So I'm gonna switch camera view so you can actually see the machine but you can see all the little circles that I've actually had set up. I'm gonna click continue in order to get the machine started. As I switch up my position, and I'm gonna click light cardstock because that's the type of material I'm using. It's gonna ask me to do something on the machine quickly in order to get it straight. And then now I'm gonna switch off quickly so you can actually see my machine. And I'm now gonna do some very, very, very DJ moves. So now you can actually see the machine. So let's go ahead and let's press start. That's the blinking icon right there. And it actually is gonna start cutting from scratch. So just like a laser cutter cuts with lasers, you can see here that the actual Cricut machine is just cutting using a small blade that's right underneath there. So I'm gonna zoom in a little bit. And you can actually see it going around in a circular pattern. Forgive it's a dark piece of cardboard, cardstock, but what you should end up with, if I'm able to do this carefully, <laughs> Okay, hopefully that transition worked well. So what you should be able to see is after you finish, you have a piece of paper with all these little circles on it. So you can actually pop these out and assemble it without having to do the trace and keep going over and making your various stacks. So right now I'm gonna pause the Cricut machine for a second so you guys can hear me. And so if I'm feeling lazy because I have this in my actual office space, I could actually cheat a little bit and just have all these circles cut out, pop them out of the piece of cardstock, and then just start assembling it to make a mini cupcake. And so that's how I would actually do our 2D design slices and making it into a 3D printed cupcake. And so, Alex, do you have anything to say about how you feel about this project so far? Because this has yep. been the funnest project for me this week outside of hot cocoa, but that's hot cocoa, I mean. It's hard to compete with hot cocoa. I mean, first of all, that's super cool and I want one of those. Um, like that is fantastic. Uh, but yeah, no, this was super fun. Like I, I feel like I learned a lot of different things. I feel like there was definitely some good iteration here. And I, I did want to just point out, um, well, two things. One, first of all, I know you don't love sprinkles, but I, again, in just like looking around my apartment for things that were around, I found these little, uh, pins from my bulletin board. And so what I'm going to do, and I'll finish, I'll finish doing this after and I'll post it on Twitter, 
Um, but I think that just poking some little pins in here is gonna make the cutest little tiny sprinkles. So I will, after, after this, I'm gonna go through and I'm gonna add, add some little sprinkles to the top of my cupcake. Um, so, which again, is just my, my push to be like, we're all, we're all mostly at home right now. We're all sort of stuck inside, but there are lots of things around you right now that if you get creative, you can make stuff out of. So I'm all about repurposing things. And like every time, like I, I've recently gotten into like trying to sew my own, or not sew my own clothing, but like patch my own clothing. And like I save stuff and try and make stuff, other stuff out of it. Like I'm a big repurposer. And so I was very excited when I figured out I could probably make these into sprinkles. So anyway, so I learned that, but I, I did want to bring up another, another iteration example, because I think again, like one of the whole things of prototyping is that you try something, you learn from it and you try again. So if I can get my screen share back up here, um, let's see if this will work. Okay. Yeah. So everybody does iteration differently. Um, I'm a big fan of this process, which is first to like make a prototype try it. I, I learn best by doing, I learn best by like getting my hands into something and actually trying it and doing it versus like planning forever. So try it and then ask a bunch of questions. So what do you like about that? What do you want to take into the next version? What do you want to leave behind? What did not work out? What did you learn? Um, what parts of the problem that you had, did you solve? So it's always good to start with a problem. Like our problem was that we wanted to make a delicious 3d printed cupcake, but had no 3d printer. So we solved that by using cardboard. So that's great. Um, and then can you try something new? And so I love that you brought up the cricket because, all right, so we tried this out of cardboard, but what other materials could we cut? How could we do this in another way? Like what's another thing at our disposal that we could try out? Um, and then repeat. And so I wanted to bring this back to our cupcakes in that sometimes you bake cupcakes and they're not great, but you learn something from them, right? Like you've learned that like maybe you need to change your recipe or maybe you need to change your baking time. So then you try it again and they get a little bit better and you realize, okay, well, and here we got blue icing again. Um, so, you know, I like the blue icing. I liked that. The flavor was good, but I want them to be a little taller. So then you try it again. And you have, you know, your finished cupcake with, these are funfetti cupcakes, but they've got beautiful icing and tall and stuff like that. And so I think baking and food is some place that we see a lot of iteration, but we don't think of it like that. I think we just sort of take for granted that like, well, you try a recipe and then you try it again and you change something. But that is this idea of prototyping and iteration and design and just sort of going through this process. But I will also say that it is totally fine if you go through this process and you get to this cupcake and you decide that actually what you wanted was a donut. Because sometimes that's what you learn out of this process is that you're iterating and you're trying something and sometimes you just have to start over at the beginning to solve your problem in a different way. So it's sort of a silly example, but I think sometimes you just, apparently I was also hungry when I was putting this together and I wanted a donut, but sometimes you just decide that like maybe this wasn't the way to solve your problem and that's okay, right? Like you can go through these projects and you learn from them. And sometimes what you learn is that you need to take an entirely different approach. So yeah, I think we're all doing iteration and we're doing prototyping. And we're trying these things all around us all the time and we just don't realize it. No, that is a perfect example. I think there was an original idea I had for these 3D printed cupcakes. And the more I was getting into the process, the more I was like, okay, I'm gonna have to pivot or change a little bit of something that I'm doing. Okay, now I'm gonna have to pivot and change a little bit of something that I'm doing. And so now I'm like, okay, I still want the cupcake, but I'm okay if this transforms into a donut. I'm totally okay. The only prompt I had was to create something that was 3D printed and was delicious. And I still find donuts are delicious. I am gonna also laugh that I think you found a picture of sprinkles on cupcakes and sprinkles on donuts. And I was like, how did you know? <laughs> <laughs> I just, I'm a big sprinkles fan, right? I love, I love a good sprinkle. I love the texture also on ice cream. That's one of my favorite things is ice cream with sprinkles on it because you get the creamy ice cream and then you get the sprinkles like a little bit of crunch. Like I'm a, I'm a big sprinkles fan. And see, I'm just like, just give me a caramel swirl any day. That's where I'm at. Okay, I'm gonna ask a quick favor from you. So I'm gonna ask if you can pitch, explain your YouTube channel. I'm gonna try to include it in the actual comments because I have a surprise, but I have to go get it. So oh. I'm not here for a second. Go okay, ahead. yeah, absolutely. So I make uh, science channel or science videos 
really about anything that I think is interesting. And so my background is in biology and genetics. So many of them are biology and genetics focused. But the idea for this project came from the fact that I made a video about 3D printed food. So I just try and take the things that I think are coolest and just try and bring them to more people because that's really my favorite thing is just talking to people about science. So I have videos, one of my favorite ones from the past year is actually going out into the field with a wildlife biologist who was looking at how wildflowers responded to wildfires here in California. So sometimes I do that, sometimes I go out into the field with a scientist and film them as they're doing their thing. And sometimes I sit at home and extract DNA from strawberries. So all kinds of different fun things, just lots of fun science and how it relates to your life. And if you're curious, I'm actually putting her YouTube channel here. And I always misspell the size, it's S I, -I yep, okay. Because it's like science. So it's bite sized, but it's S C I Z E D. See, it took me forever to figure that out. I was like, that's not her last name. <laughs> Why is that? <gasps> science and it's science. Bite oh, that's so cute. See, that's different from us. So I run Bajika, which no one can spell, but the purpose of it is means idea. That's why we call our TV series M Lab, because everyone can spell M Lab. Yes. A little gift that will be sitting your way as a thank you. So I oh, printer. oh, it's adorable. We're making these into earrings and they'll be on your way to you for when all this mess clears up to say thank you so much for taking your time to hop on this webinar with us. So this is the actual Tinkercad cupcake. I am a bit of a spoiled person. I do have a 3D printer. So that's fair. You. So thank, thank you so you. much for sharing your afternoon with us. Thank you for having me. That is so sweet. I am so, so excited. I, oh my gosh, that just makes me so happy. I'm going to put it right next to mine or, oh, you said earrings. Oh no, I'm going to wear those. <laughs> oh, I'm so excited about that. So you'll have, this is, this is my better cupcake. I am still a CAD modeler through and through. So even though I'm making the cardboard one, I go, here's this 3D printed one for you. So I love it. It's beautiful. So if you haven't already, feel free to follow Alex on her YouTube channel, as well as her Twitter. I'm not going to say anything else in regards to that. Make sure you have a parent or guardian when you subscribe, if you're under 18. But meanwhile, I hope you guys enjoyed this. This was a, this was a blast this week, but in particular, this hands-on session. I think yesterday, some of you had some doubts about why is she overcomplicating Tinkercad? Why can't she just leave Tinkercad be? But I hope you understand that Tinkercad isn't just sending things to the 3D printer, even though that's really cool. I hope you realize that it's a playground for you to play around with how to bring your ideas to life. So I hope you continue to build, make, learn, and let's tinker together the rest of these times. Thank you so much, Alex. Thank you so much to Autodesk for sponsoring this. And until next time, build, make, learn. Ciao, guys. Bye. Do, 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 do.